Uh, today's talk is just a basic intro talk. Um, we're going to just fo focus on the diagnostic side. Um, and this is mostly geared towards the new fellows, um, but certainly anybody who's, you know, who's uh, getting into diagnostic ultrasound or wants a little refresher, I um, mean, this would be, would be reasonable for them as well. So uh, we'll try to keep within uh, half an hour, hopefully, uh, or until somebody starts knocking on my door here telling me I have to see patients. All right, so uh, a few disclosures. We're not talking about anything today, uh, but basic stuff. There is some homework, and so we do have a, a bit longer, more comprehensive talk that's available on the AMS system website. So hopefully people are familiar with this, but for any of the new fellows, uh, make sure that you quickly become acquainted with the resources that we have on the AMS system website. So if you go to uh, the main website and go to the sports ultrasound homepage, you'll find uh, a link to the online ultrasound didactics. And so John Finoff and I put these together several years ago now. Um, I think we have over 35 different uh, videos. So we have live scanning videos, we have pathology videos, procedure videos. Um, and this website will continue to be updated um, with, with new stuff that comes out. And particularly as we start to introduce the new curriculum, uh, which is almost finished. Um, I've been promising it for a while, it's almost there. Um, you'll start to see new stuff popping up on here. So make sure you're acquainted with this website. Uh, but for today's homework, um, go to the Principles of Sports Ultrasound and Introduction to Scanning Techniques video. Um, this will be a little bit more in depth than what we're gonna cover today. Um, I think it's about an hour long or so, but again, another really good review um, that everybody should make sure they're familiar with. So today we're gonna to talk about appropriate uh, indications, discuss some limitations. I wanna go through just some normal appearance uh, of, of tissues and some general principles of common pathology. So don't get caught up uh, on any of the details of some of the pathology. We're just talking big picture stuff today. Um, so you can start to get used to uh, recognizing normal versus not normal. And then we'll briefly talk about uh, some artifacts as well that you should be aware of as you're starting to scan. So most of you are aware of this, but there's multiple advantages uh, with ultrasound. Um, some people are, are surprised to find that it has higher resolution than MRI, and it's actually much better at imaging superficial structures such as tendons and nerves. Uh, there's minimal metal artifacts. We use this a lot for post-operative imaging uh, around orthopedic hardware uh, and other areas um, where traditional MRI and CT um, may have some limitations due to, due to the metal artifact. Um, obviously, we can scan in real time, and so we can do dynamic studies um, that otherwise you can't do on static imaging. And so looking at ligament instability, um, trying to actually correlate pain symptoms uh, with the location uh, of the potential pathology is helpful, um, as you mentioned, hardware complications. Um, there's been several studies looking actually at patient satisfaction. Patients actually prefer ultrasound um, compared to other imaging modalities. Um, and, and so lots of folks are you know, very interested in, in patient satisfaction and Prescani scores and other things. And so this is actually one way that you can potentially improve that in your practice. Um, and then in terms of uh, safety, there's really no radiation. Well, well, there is no radiation. There's really no known bio effects uh, associated with ultrasound. We think it's, a, it's a safe to do. Um, and so again, that's helpful, uh, probably more so even, even for the uh, physician performing it um, than for the uh, patient just because of the repeated exposures. And so, um, you know, any, anybody who's worked with somebody who's done, uh, you know, a lifetime of fluoro guided procedures, um, you know, knows that, that those that does come with some risk um, for the individual performing that. Uh, and then cost, um, you know, that this can be an advantage or disadvantage depending on your vantage point, uh, but ultrasound is considerably cheaper, um, also reimburses considerably cheaper. In terms of limitations, the one everybody likes to talk about is operator dependence, uh, and then that's certainly true. So the images are obtained manually. Um, so unlike an MRI or CT where there's a sequence and the images are all put together, you know, by a computer and then they're read afterwards, really these images are obtained um, and, and are best interpreted at the time of image acquisition. And so there's certainly a chance that you don't get the appropriate image uh, and then then there's no possible way you're going to be able to call the appropriate pathology and it is difficult for other people to kind of overread these images at times or at least to the degree that you would be able to get uh, the information when you're when you're reading at the time of acquisition um, 
uh, well, one of my uh, uh, mentors in residency used to like to always say, you find what you look for and you look for what you know. Uh, and this is certainly true with ultrasound. And I think this is one of the, the advantages actually, but, but if you're not sure what you're looking for, then you're probably not going to find it. Um, and if you're you know, relying on somebody else doing the scanning and you're trying to overread, this does become a limiter because sometimes there are some nuances uh, that you really have to go looking for. Um, the other thing to, to remember here too is all imaging is operator dependent. And so MRI is, is operator dependent as well. If you don't have the appropriate sequences, uh, we see this all the time. Um, you know, x-ray is operator dependent uh, if you don't have the appropriate view. And so, um, so I feel like a lot of people will just, we use this as an excuse not to use ultrasound. Um, and certainly it's a limitation we need to appreciate, um, but, but all imaging has the same limitation. Uh, deep structures are difficult, and so so uh, particularly um, subcutaneous fat will attenuate sound waves, and so so things get you know the larger the patient gets, the harder it is to see deep structures, and so sometimes you may be significantly limited in what you can see, um, just secondary to that. Um, from from a sports perspective, um, large athletes typically it's still image fairly well, and so if you have a large quantity of muscle tissue, um, that's much less. Um, uh, limiting in terms of what you're going to be able to see through. So you can usually still get very good images on our, you know, football linemen and such. Um, although it's always going to look better, you know, on a, on a more superficial um, structures uh, and thinner athletes. You do have a limited field of view, and so you know you're you're holding the transducer. That that's the area that you're visualizing, and so it's really a very thin slice. And so um, sometimes that does uh, give you some limitations, and it can make it difficult to get perspective. And so um, you know even something simply as as trying to identify which rib level you're at or something like that, um, you know, takes a little bit of work uh, as opposed to something like an X-ray where it's very easy to, to count because of a larger field of view. Uh, remember, intraarticular structures are going to have inherent limitations because ultrasound cannot see through bone. And so if you're trying to look uh, around bone, through bone, uh, you're going to have a difficult time. And so uh, certainly for most intraarticular pathology, MRI and, and CT are going to be uh, our imaging modalities of choice, although you can get uh, important intraarticular information, uh, identify joint recesses, look for synovitis. You can get, you know, windows into, um, you know, labrum and menisci and such. Um, um, but you're still never going to get a full evaluation like you would with, a, with an MRI. Uh, equipment can be a limiter. And so just remember, there's multiple types of ultrasound equipment available today. And so you have, you have you know, everything from a handheld uh, unit that really fits in your pocket at this point, all the way up to, uh, you know, a big $200,000 ultrasound cart. And, uh, and you're going to be able to do different things with these different types of, of ultrasound machines. And so just remember that. Um, you know, there are things that, that you just can't do with the handheld, uh, and that's fine. Um, and that's just a limitation of that equipment at that point. And so, um, so as you get more comfortable scanning on different machines, you'll kind of get an idea of what you can and can't see, uh, and when it's appropriate to refer on uh, for a more formal study uh, on a higher quality ultrasound cart. Uh, and then last is going to be reimbursements. We mentioned this with cost. This is the double-edged sword. So cost is low, which is good. Uh, reimbursements low, which which may be bad. Um, you know, I had one uh, physician who who I was um, a pain anesthesia pain uh, medicine doc who you know said they just stopped teaching ultrasound because it wasn't even worth it anymore. Um, it was reimbursed so low. And unfortunately, I've had colleagues who who have really stopped doing diagnostic ultrasound because it's just hard to make it fit in a business plan. And so um, so there's ways you know hopefully around that. But but again, unfortunately, that is a limitation at this point for integration into practice. All right, we're going to do ultrasound physics next, and this is really going to be ultrasound physics for dummies. And so on the, uh, the link that, that I mentioned earlier, there's a bit more in-depth discussion of some of the physics. I'm not going to get into that today. Um, this is really all we're going to talk about. So the, the basics that you all need to understand uh, of ultrasound, of how it works, is you have a sound wave that's going to be transmitted out of the transducer. Uh, and then some of that sound is going to get reflected back, as you can see here. So sound's going to come down, some of it's going to get transmitted into the tissue, some of it's going to get reflected back. Um, what you want is as much of this to get reflected back to the transducer as possible, because that's what's going to get uh, converted into an image on the screen for you to see. And so if you have your sound waves coming in at an angle like this, 
a certain amount is going to reflect back away from your transducer. And so only a, only a small amount of those sound waves are going to actually make it back. And this is going to form the basis for an artifact we're going to talk about called anisotropy, uh, which is really the thing that you're constantly struggling with in MSK imaging. And so you just always want to think you want to orient your sound waves directly towards the structure that you are trying to image so that the maximum amount of sound waves comes back to your transducer. So that, that's our, our physics lesson for the day. Uh, we'll mention some brief terminology. Um, I have this work in progress here because we are com completing a uh, multi-society uh, terminology consensus statement um, that's that's almost complete as well. And so this will hopefully be published later this year, uh, which will be a nice resource to hopefully just to bring some um, some consensus to some of the, the language that we use um, that can sometimes get confusing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of, uh, of the terminologies now that everybody should just be familiar with. And then uh, we'll certainly send out um, some information for folks to uh, whenever that other terminology consensus is done. Um, so I think that would be a good reference. Um, so you're, we're going to have different um, echogenicity lingo, and so everybody should be familiar with this. And so it's pretty straightforward. Um, so isoechoic means the same, and so these are relative terms, and so, so that's going to mean the same reflection as another structure. Uh, and then hypoechoic is going to have a lower reflection. Hyperechoic is going to have a higher reflection. So hypo is dark, hyper is bright, iso is the same. Again, it's a relative term. And then anechoic is going to be no reflection. So no echoes, which is going to be black. And so the, this is very common terminology. You should just get very familiar with because uh, you're going to see it and hear it a lot. Uh, in terms of equipment, we have several types of transducers. They are transducers. They are not probes. Uh, if you want to get me really worked up, say probe. Um, everyone who knows me will laugh, but I hate that word, and we should use transducers. Uh, and that is in our official uh, terminology consensus document. So there are several types of transducers. Um, the Most of what we're going to work with in MSK are going to be either linear or curved. And so these are pretty straightforward. It's either straight or it's curved. Um, so, so there's nothing too fancy here and it's just the way that the, the crystals are aligned uh, and you'll be able to tell the difference because a linear is going to come out looking like a box and the curve is going to come out looking like a fan. Um, and so there are, you know, with say, say like the new butterfly transducer that, that can kind of switch modes because it's a little bit different. Um, so you may see some different things and some machines will have like virtual convex off of a linear. So there is a little bit of nuance here, um, but by and large, just be familiar. Um, these two transducers look very different. The third that you may or may not have access to something called a hockey stick or a short footprint uh, linear array. It's called a hockey stick because it actually looks like a hockey stick. Um, um, and these are small little transducers that are helpful around the hand uh, in the foot in the foot and ankle. Um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of you may not have one of these available, so don't worry about it. But if you do a lot of, you know, fine imaging, um, you know, of small structures, they can be helpful, mostly because they fit into small spaces uh, where sometimes the larger linear transducers may have difficulty. Um, for the ER folks, you're probably familiar with phase transducers. This is more for, for cardiac scanning and such, so uh, we won't talk too much about those. From a frequency perspective, you're going to see numbers labeled on your transducers, and that's going to represent the frequency. Most of these transducers are going to scan across a range of frequencies. What you need to understand here is that the higher the number, the higher the frequency, the better your resolution, but the lower your penetration. So, um, so a lot of, uh, you know, say a hockey stick may be like a 15 to seven, um, and we have a linear that's a 24 megahertz. And so those higher numbers are gonna give you really great pictures of very superficial structures, but they're gonna really struggle at depth. The lower frequency is going to give you lower resolution, but much better penetration. And so um, you can think of this like music, right? So you can hear the bass of the music, you know, coming, you know, outside of the, the club or your, you know, loud neighbor watching a movie at night when you're trying to sleep. That, that's what you hear. You hear those low frequencies. And so those are what's going to travel, uh, whereas you're not going to hear those higher frequencies that well. Um, so, you know, like the, like the voice dialogue in a movie or something. So this is important. So as you start to pick your transducer, you're going to want to know uh, what you're looking at 
And there may be times if you're looking at different structures at different depths, you may have to switch transducers or otherwise alter your frequency. So some ultrasound machines will allow you to alter the frequency uh, and kind of cheat the range a little higher or a little lower with that transducer uh, to help optimize your image. So this is one of the things you should become very familiar with on your ultrasound unit because you'll need to use this um, all the time. Like literally every scan, you should be making some adjustments to these to try to optimize your image. All right, transducer manipulation. This is an area of a lot of, of controversy and a lot of uh, confusion. And this, I think, really makes it hard for folks trying to learn because people will be telling you to do something with a transducer and they use 10 different, different words and you have no idea what they're talking about. And people will use uh, you know, the same word to mean different things. And so this is uh, one of the things we tried to address in our, our terminology consensus and hopefully we can start to uh, be consistent with this. Um, but what we did is, is when you're moving the transducer uh, in either, either long or short axis um, from point A to point B, we're gonna call that a slide. And so his, historically people have called these different things. It gets very confusing when you're calling these different things. Uh, and, and there's probably five different words that are floating around for this. Um, so I think it's most helpful just to think of this motion as sliding the transducer and then you can add some sort of modifier to that. So you're gonna slide it, you know, a certain direction. Um, so you may wanna say, you know, you're gonna do a short axis, you know, slide, you know, proximally up the biceps or something like that. Um, so, so hopefully this will, will make things a little bit more straightforward for folks instead of talking about sliding and sweeping and translating and, and everything else. Uh, then the other movement are going to be tilt and heel toe. So tilt um, sometimes has been called wag as well because it's like a dog wagging its tail. Um, this is going to be uh, a motion in the in the short axis of the transducer, whereas the heel toe is in the long axis of the transducer. And these motions are essentially to 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 line up your sound waves with the structure that you're looking at because the structures inside the body are not always perfectly aligned with the with the, the cutaneous tissue and the superficial tissue, right? So, so this allows you to, to angle the beams of the ultrasound so that you can get it, uh, get the, the, the best image and get the most amount of sound waves coming back to your transducer like we talked about with our little physics slide. So tilt this way, heel toe this way. Uh, the other ones are going to be rotate and pivot. And so the difference between rotate and pivot, is, as hopefully you can see here, is rotate, you're moving around a central axis. So this is what you might use if you're moving from a short axis to a long axis view of a structure. You want to keep that structure in the center of the screen, and you're simply rotating your transducer uh, around that to get a, uh, an orthogonal image. With pivoting, um, you're, you're fixing the end of the transducer. And so some people would call this, you know, like a window wiper or, you know, di different types of, of, of goofy things. Um, but I prefer pivot because um, that makes sense. And so you're anchoring the, you know, the, the end of the transducer and then you are, you know, sweeping or, or wiping or whatever you want to say the other end. Uh, across the structure. And so this is going to be helpful, say, if you are trying to track a needle and you're coming across the needle and you don't have it in full view, you know, you may want to, you know, pivot. So you get this, you get the needle in view here and then you want to keep it there and then you want to swing your transducer around to bring it in line so you can see your needle. So that's an example when you might use pivot. Uh, a few others that, that are more straight, uh, straightforward, and so compression is going to be when you simply compress the tissues. So we'll use this for various things from uh, confirming if an area is tender uh, to trying to look at fluid, um, you know, versus soft tissue masses and documenting compressibility. And then there's uh, standoff. And so there's two types of standoff. So with standoff, typically we are gonna have um, ultrasound uh, coupling gel here and the transducer will be floating on top of the, the gel over the skin. Um, and then an oblique standoff would be if we're actually contacting um, the skin here and then we have the gel here. We use these um, quite a bit for interventions, um, but you may need to use this in certain instances, diagnostically, if, if you want to eliminate any pressure, if you're looking at a very superficial structure, perhaps you're looking, uh, you know, at foreign bodies or, um, you know, or things where you need to see if there's a track from the skin, those, those would be examples when you might want to use these techniques. 
All right, image optimization. So this is what you should think about every time you sit down um, to image a patient. So, so obviously, you know, you got to turn the machine on and all that stuff. But then the next step is going to be picking out which transducer. And so that's going to be based on the stuff we already talked about. So what frequency do you need? Are you trying to look deep? Are you trying to look superficial? Do you need a certain size of your footprint to fit into, you know, a little nook or cranny? Um, then you want to look at your imaging presets. And so most machines are going to have presets, which is essentially going to take care of the frequency for you. Um, you may have a specific musculoskeletal preset. You know, you may have a superficial versus a deep preset. Um, depending on, on your ultrasound, you may have the ability to actually tweak these and modify, um, you know, with, with the uh, manufacturer. So, so find, you know, presets. If you don't have specific presets, then, then tweak your frequency. Um, then you want to get the depth. Um, so you want you don't want to waste um, you don't want to waste space on your screen, and so you want to have the, your target structure essentially in the middle of the screen, um, so that you you have the best visualization. Then, if you have the ability to move a focal zone, you want to put the focal zone at the level of the of the uh, region of interest, and then the gain. The gain is simply the brightness on the screen, and so uh, many machines may have an auto gaining feature where the computer um, will kind of uh, give you the what, what it feels is the optimal brightness, um, but then you can adjust that yourself. Um, this is there. This is probably the area that has the most personal preference. Um, but there is kind of an optimal range where things are going to look the best. So this is what you should walk through every time as you sit down, you know, make sure you have the appropriate transducer, the appropriate preset, the optimized frequency, you want your depth appropriate for the, for the structure that you're going to image, the focus appropriate for that structure you're going to image, and then the gain. And then these things, you may have to adjust all of these during the same scan. So say if you're doing a shoulder evaluation, you know, sometimes you may actually change out every one of these things depending on where, what you're looking at at that specific region. So don't be afraid to, uh, to make some modifications and just become comfortable with that. All right, so that's the, the nuts and bolts of, uh, of, of the ultrasound machines, how they work, and, uh, and how to optimize an image. Uh, again, we'll, we'll kind of re-hit all this stuff throughout the year, um, you know, in each of the individual scanning, and, and then hopefully um, for, for those of you not here, you know, during your individual scanning sessions and through the year, you'll be, you know, constantly working on these things until it becomes second nature. So next, we're just going to briefly, um, briefly, briefly go through some normal versus not normal. Uh, again, don't get caught up with, with any of the nuances of pathology here. This is really just kind of to start seeing normal versus not normal, okay? So here's a rotator cuff, and this is a, a good representation of the structures you're going to be looking at with MSK. And so as we shoot down into the body, the first thing we're going to encounter is the skin. So the skin's going to be this layer here. Deep to the skin is going to be sub-Q tissue. Um, this is a, a healthy athlete who really has minimal sub-Q tissue over the anterior shoulder, so we don't really see much in this tissue plane. Then we're going to come into muscle tissue. Muscle tissue is going to be dark here, um, and then we're going to start seeing bright lines, and so the bright line here is going to be the acromion, so it's going to be bone. We can tell it's a bone because there's a deep shadow behind it. We'll talk about this in a minute, but as we mentioned already, the sound waves don't penetrate through the bone. They all reflect back. Because they all reflect back, the bone, bone looks very bright here, and then we can't see anything through it, so this is called posterior acoustic shadowing. As we come to here, we can see some bright tissue. So this is going to be fascial tissue down into bursa. And then we get to the rotator cuff. Rotator cuff is the thing that looks like tendon fibers coming across. And so uh, fortunately, most tendons are going to have a very similar appearance. They're going to have this nice gray. They're not as dark as the muscle. Um, they're not as bright as the bone. And then below that, we're going to see dark stuff. So this is going to represent articular cartilage here. Um, and then we're going to have the bright bone, which is the greater tuberosity of the humerus. And so um, just general anatomy goes a long way with ultrasound. And so you need to just start to understand tendon looks like this, bone looks like this, muscle looks like this. Then you need to know what you're expecting to see based on where your transducer is placed. And so, um, so those are kind of the things as you really get started, it's going to be just starting to recognize what tissues look like. And then you have to know your anatomy um, so that you know what to expect whenever you are um, placing your transducer in a certain location. 
So this is just the same view. We flipped our transducer into a uh, short axis view or we, uh, we rotated it rather. And so now we can see again, skin looks like this. Now we see a little bit of subacute tissue here posteriorly. Uh, we come down to muscle, again, tendon. So notes the same echo texture. Things look slightly differently now because we're in a, in a different imaging plane, but the colors are still the same. Um, and you know we still see the same shadowing behind the bone here. Um, cartilage still looks black. So we can see these alternating layers and getting used to these kind of alternating layers is pretty helpful. It's very helpful in the rotator cuff, but we'll see this at other places as well. And so if you can kind of count down from, from superficial all the way to deep um, and know what the structure should be, this will really help you, um, particularly with more challenging scans when the anatomy is altered or in post-operative imaging. So here's an example of a, of a tear. And so what you should notice here is things just don't look normal. And so the other images, everything was smooth, was clean. Now we start to see things that just don't look normal, right? We see this, this doesn't look normal. This is some irregularity in the greater tuberosity. We see this, which then abrupt change uh, within, the, within this structure. So before we saw this nice rotator cuff, now we see this thing that doesn't look right. Right, so you should just start to notice, okay, this doesn't look right. We'll get into all the nuances of why this is a full thickness tear and why there are, you know, some of these artifacts here and things that can help. Um, but any of these irregularities, any of these inconsistencies should start to catch your eye. Uh, and then anytime you see something you think might be irregular, you need to be able to rotate your transducer and confirm it in more than one plane because sometimes you can get fooled. Um, but in this instance, we were able to see this clearly. There's something that's not right and we can confirm that indeed it does exist and we see it in more than one plane. Sometimes you might not see anything at all. Um, and this can, can, can sometimes be almost more difficult for folks to recognize when there's very um, profound pathology than when it's more subtle. Um, so here we just don't see a rotator cuff at all. Um, but if you're not aware or, or looking for a structure to sit here, you know, this may not look horribly abnormal to you. And so this is one of those instances where counting layers is really helpful. So again, skin, sub -Q tissue, come down to some muscle tissue, and then we're all the way at bone. Uh, and we're missing a whole layer of tissue through here. Um, and so this is something where as you're starting off, you know, maybe take a look at the other side, you know, again, review your anatomy, count your layers, um, and, um, and, and don't be afraid to, you know, to go out in the limb and say, you know, I think this thing's completely gone. All right, so a few more um, tendon examples. And so this is common extensor tendon. Again, we can see nice tendon fibers coming through. And then we see this very nice uh, appearance of the lateral epicondyle, the ski, so, ski jump appearance um, where the tendon inserts. And so, so be familiar with these bony landmarks because uh, this will keep you out of trouble and give you a good place to orient. And so you, you wanna feel very confident that you have the right imaging plane. And oftentimes the bone is what's gonna allow you to do that. Um, here's uh, an example of uh, a pretty significant pathology here. And in, you know, a lot of times folks may just struggle saying, okay, is this, uh, is this just me not getting a good image? Am I not in the right imaging plane? But this is where you can use that, that bony landmark to feel confident that indeed you are in the correct imaging plane. And this is just severe pathology of the tendon. Uh, we'll jump through this quickly. Here's just the patellar tendon. Again, the, the thing to pick up here is going to be uh, oftentimes pathology will, will occur in, in pretty uh, typical locations. And so with patellar tendon, the majority of stuff you're going to see is going to be at this deep aspect here, centrally in the tendon. So this is going to be very characteristic of jumper's knee. And we're seeing things that we've already seen, right? We're seeing cortical irregularity. We're seeing a very different appearance here, the tendon than the surrounding tendon. So this should be pretty easy to pick up as not normal. And then we flip and we rotate into short axis and we can see, uh, again, we're able to confirm this region um, that we saw in the long axis view. Uh, tendon sheath tendons are going to have a slightly different look. And so with, with these tubular tendon sheath tendons, we're going to also evaluate for tenosynovitis. And so for, uh, for thickening fluid hyperemic tissue within the tenosynovium, as we can see here. Uh, and then the tear pattern here will be a little bit different. So oftentimes these will have what we call longitudinal tearing. And so in this instance, we can see the fibularis brevis here. Looks like Pac-Man eating a little, uh, a little pellet, uh, which is the fibularis long 
longest when these should be two, um, two circular structures next to each other. And so this is a tear pattern that you'll see in these uh, tubular tendon sheath type tendons um, that's a little different than what you might see in the patellar tendon or the Achilles tendon. And again, don't get too caught up on the in nuances of pathology, um, just looking at the general, uh, general principles. So we moved to muscle injury. Muscle injury um, is, is something that's a little bit more nuanced, uh, but with, you know, with lots of practice, you can actually get really good at muscle imaging, uh, particularly in athletes who, who have, uh, uh, are well muscled with low subcutaneous tissue. They image actually quite nicely and I think better than MRI. Um, here again, you're, you're looking for tissue planes and then differences. So you can see muscle, fascial tissue, and then we see this area that just doesn't look normal, right? Most things in the body aren't going to look like this. So we can see very linear, very regular tissues all around, and then this stuff looks different. It's actually hyperechoic, it's edematous. We see free fluid, which is anechoic here, uh, and then we see these, these uh, muscle fibers, which have actually, um, you know, retracted back, and that's why they are now kind of sitting here balled up, and we don't see these nice, uh, this, this nice fibers like we see in the, around. Uh, and again, we have to confirm this in, in multiple imaging planes, uh, but we can see the difference. So the body normally is very regular, and then we can see this area where we lose that regularity, and now we have a different color as well. Uh, this is just an example of some myositis ossificans, and so this is an, an instance where you shouldn't expect to see stuff that looks like bone in the middle of muscle, right? So this should immediately make you think this does not look normal, this does not look right. Uh, you could do a quick side-to-side -side comparison, uh, but the history here should already have your interest peaked for the possibility, and this should be a pretty quick, easy diagnosis. Uh, ligaments are going to look uh, similar to tendons because they're usually a little bit more tightly packed. The key here is always going to be getting the appropriate alignment and so it's going to be your bony anatomy is really going to be helpful here. So this is an example of a high ankle sprain so we can see the tibia, uh, tibia and fibula here. We have a very nice AITFL ligament and then we can see the sprain is going to be just disruption in this nice normal fibers and so um, you know it's pretty straightforward. We see cortical irregularity, we don't see these fibers bridging. Uh, and again, the key is really going to be making sure that you're confident that you're in the same imaging plane here, uh, that you're lined up appropriately. This just comes with practice. And again, making sure you're, you're always um, using your, your bony landmarks uh, for appropriate orientation. Nerves are going to are gonna look um, uh, different in, in a slightly different way. Um, they're going to have uh, swelling and what we call fascicular loss. And so um, by that, we, we normally, normally nerve is gonna have a honeycomb appearance where we see multiple small little stippled dots. And we're gonna see less of those dots if the nerve is edematous. And so when it swells, you're gonna have, um, you know, sometimes just a few of these fascicles that you see. And that's what we refer to as fascicular loss, which essentially represents um, just intraneural edema. Uh, ideally, it's great whenever you can see actual point of compression. So here in the carpal tunnel, we can see uh, an area where there's an abrupt change in size of the nerve, um, right where the transverse carpal ligament comes across. And so, so sometimes it's not quite this obvious, but this always this will kind of seal the, um, you know, seal the diagnosis for you pretty straightforward. Um, here's another example. This is an ulnar nerve um, with ongoing um, instability and, uh, and compression after a transposition. And so we can see, you know, kinking of the nerve here where it takes this abrupt turn and this large amount of swelling proximal to that. And so again, and anything that makes these abrupt changes, um, it should catch your eye because that's not typical uh, how we're going to expect to see structures moving in the body. Uh, bone and joint pathology is actually pretty straightforward. We're somewhat limited in what we can see um, with, um, you know, with bones and joints. And so usually it's pretty straightforward. We're looking for, uh, for breaks in the cortex for fractures. And so this is an acromion uh, fracture. And the nice thing here is the patient's going to tell you right where the fracture is because that's right where it hurts. Um, so you can basically put the transducer down. And you can ask them to put it over where they, where they broke their bone. And you should see something that looks like this. Um, we can see normal there's the nice smooth cortex that we've been used to seeing. We can see this, this step off here. Actually with transducer pressure, you'll see some motion here. Um, this anechoic region is hematoma. Um, you may have different, uh, different uh, echogenicities here based on um, if this is uh, still some free fluid versus if it started to, uh, to organize. But you'll get a perifracture hematoma and potentially some hyperemia.
Um, this is just another example. It started to form some callus. Uh, so I think a lot of this stuff, you know, really will make some clinical sense once you just get used to what these tissues start to look like. Uh, and then last thing is just joint effusion. So this will just be, uh, you know, I, you know, typically if it's a simple effusion, you'll have an anechoic um, compressible amount of fluid sitting within a joint recess. So this is the knee recess. We can see in both tissue planes, every joint's gonna have a slightly different recess, which you'll have to become familiar with. Um, and, and this fluid should be compressible if it's fluid. So if it's true effusion, uh, and usually should be dark. So this would be a simple effusion, which is anechoic. Uh, there's some nuances here, which we'll talk more about, you know, throughout the year, whether you start to see some tissue there, which could be synovitis, or if you see a more complex fluid collection, like you may see, uh, you know, in an infection or a hemarthrosis. Um, but, you know, for now, just get used to identifying where the joint recesses are. Uh, and if you think there's, uh, there's fluid or not. All right, last thing we'll try to wrap up here quickly um, are going to be some of our pearls and pitfalls. And so we mentioned anisotropy before. This is the thing that you'll struggle with all year long. Um, and it's, it's the, the hardest thing in MSK imaging because uh, relatively subtle transducer movements can really fool you into thinking something that's normal is abnormal. And so here's the exact same Achilles tendon. So this is a, an optimal image with the appropriate transducer placement. We can see this nice echo texture of the Achilles. And then if we simply tilt our transducer even a few degrees, uh, all of a sudden we're, we're losing a lot of those sound waves that are coming back to the transducer. So they're reflecting away. And so because they're not coming back and they're reflecting away, um, you're gonna get a darker image. And unfortunately, tendinosis is going to be dark tendon, right? And so this could look like Achilles tendinosis, uh, where indeed it's just a, just poor imaging. It's just anisotropy. So, so this is where you're going to have to constantly be making these adjustments with your transducer and convincing yourself um, that you're not going to be able to correct any anisotropy. So if this is truly tendinosis, no matter how you tilt your transducer is still going to uh, continue to be dark. Here's another example. It's very common. So this is the rotator cuff. And because these fibers are curving down, um, you'll often get this region of anisotropy. This looks like a tear, right? But if you take your transducer from the gold to the blue and just orient it slightly different, you can clean this whole area up. This is the exact same tendon. And you can see that indeed fibers come all the way through. So, um, so you always have to consider that anytime you're going to call pathology, um, that you're not over calling something, um, particularly in an instance where it may lead to potential surgical intervention for, uh, for a normal, normal tendon. Another artifact we'll commonly see is something called edge shadowing. And so this can be helpful um, when trying to pick up um, pathology. And so this is an Achilles tendon tear. And we can see where the, where the tendon is, uh, is completely torn and it's devoid of any fibers. Below that, we're going to get the shadowing artifact. So it's off you know, exactly what it says. It's off the edge. And so if you give yourself a little bit more depth, this actually becomes a bit more apparent. So this is a trick you can use sometimes in trying to identify, um, you know, if it, if a structure is torn or not, um, is give yourself a little bit bigger field of view and more perspective and look for this edge shadowing. If you're seeing that, then that should, should uh, significantly raise your suspicion for potential uh, tear at that location. We can also use it to pick up structures that otherwise may be difficult to find. So here's just coming across the A1 pulley, which is a small structure of the hand. And we can see once we get across, uh, or once we get to that level, we'll see this kind of this edge shadowing, which represents this kind of ha dark halo around the, the tendons here. So sometimes you can use it to help um, pick out the level if you're otherwise having str um, struggling to find it uh, in perhaps a long axis. We talked about acoustic shadowing a bit before with the bone. So here's just an example of a calcification where we can see some acoustic shadowing. Um, and then the, you can see it's slightly different than the normal bony shadowing, but this is a pretty hard calcification because we're not penetrating it with sound waves. We can also get shadowing from fibrous septae in the muscle. And so here's an example of fibrous septae in the deltoid. Um, and here's the, uh, the biceps tendon. And so this can actually cause some trouble at times because if you're imaging through this, 
this, it can make it look dark. So you can see we're actually moving this shadow back and forth across the tendon. And so um, just another thing to be aware of, particularly in, in, in healthy, well-muscled young athletes, you'll, you'll see quite a bit of this stuff. And so you may have to angle your transducer slightly, um, just a slight tilt or a heel toe um, to try to get rid of that shadowing artifact um, to make sure you're seeing the, the, the deep structure as well. Um, enhancement, something we talk more about with you know abdominal imaging and stuff, but you will see this deep to cyst. And so because you're not getting your normal sound wave attenuation, um, the sound waves are able to move more freely through the fluid uh, and then are reflected back deep to that area. It's going to look very bright. And so you can see how this looks really bright here compared to over here. This is going to be a, um, acoustic enhancement or, or increase through transmission. So this is a, a big olecranon bursal fluid collection, but we'll use this to help us um, oftentimes differentiate fluid filled from solid tissues. Um, although again, there are some nuances with this, with soft, with, um, with soft tissue mass imaging, but, but by and large, this is something that you should comment on when you're seeing uh, a cyst or a fluid collection uh, around an area, particularly um, if it's not clear um, you know, that, that it is a cystic structure and it, it may be potentially a, a solid mass. Uh, and then reverberation artifact is something we'll see around metal. And so this is common with hardware or you'll see it every time you do an injection uh, or you're otherwise putting a metal device in the body. And so we can see the shadowing from metal uh, is what we call a kind of a dirty shadow, whereas bone shadowing is clean. And so here's bone. So we can see pretty clean shadow. Now we get to the plate that we can see in the radiograph and we can see the shadow is slightly different. It's this kind of dirty shadow from the reverberation of the metal. And we can actually see the, the screw hole holes uh, where the sound waves look different as they come down through. And so, um, so this reverberation is going to give you, you know, if, and if it's something straight, um, like a needle, you can see here these multiple um, kind of linear uh, hyperechoic lines kind of coming down. So that's what a needle is going to look like and a true reverberation artifact. All right, I think this is the last thing. Uh, this is this mirror image artifact. We don't see this a lot in MSK. Um, you see this more around uh, around the the. Um uh, the lungs and such, but this can be helpful um, when you do see just to recognize this as a thing so that you don't get in trouble. So here's that same olecranon bursa. And so we can see because this is superficial and because we're getting um, this increase through transmission, we're actually creating a mirror image on the bottom part of the screen. And so this is not real. This is just a reflection of this, just like if you're looking out in a pond, right? And so it's helpful to know that because you don't want to try to aspirate this stuff here because you're just going to end up doing a, you know, a bone biopsy um, if you're trying to jam your needle down through here. So it's just helpful to recognize um, that, that this can happen. And usually it's around very strong reflectors. And so oftentimes from an MSK standpoint, we're really only seeing this in this instance where we have these superficial fluid collections um, up against bone where we're getting this very strong reflection that will end up creating this mirror image artifact. All right, so I know that was quick um, running through, particularly that last part. Uh, but again, don't get caught up too much in the nuances. Just try to get familiar with what normal tissue looks like, and then and and then what uh, what abnormal tissue looks like. And so, um, you know, in some degree, this is just lots of repetition and uh, and somewhat trusting your gut and if something looks normal or not normal. Um, and then as the year progresses, you'll be able to start to um, you know characterize that and define it. And, and that'll come with, with practice and, and learning the specific nuances of the anatomic regions. Um, but really trying to just get that big picture view and lots of practice, um, you know, on anyone who will let you scan and you can scan yourself uh, and even just scanning, um, you know, your knees and your forearms and everything else to get used to, you know, what those normal tissue planes look like and how the body is oriented, um, typically in, in, a, in a fairly linear organized fashion um, will then help you be able to, to kind of automatically pick up whenever something doesn't look quite right. Um, and then you can work on being able to, to actually, you know, define and describe what doesn't look like a little bit better. But, you know, don't get too caught up in that initially. Um, you know, I think it's really helpful just to get the big picture of normal, not normal, um, before you start getting too, too far into the weeds. And then really just learning your anatomy um, throughout the year, trying to correlate it. Because um, if you don't know the anatomy, you're never, you're, you're not going to be able to do this. It's kind of the language um, of imaging. And so you just really have to know that. 
All right, guys. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful. Uh, again, we have a little bit, um, a little bit longer, more in-depth lecture on some of the physics and, and biology and stuff that's available on the website. Um, as always, you can reach out to me with any questions, and uh, and hopefully look forward to seeing the the new curriculum and the terminology consensus, um, which should be coming out uh, at some point, um, hopefully soon, uh, early this fall. Everybody have a good Friday and we will um, be back next week with our, um, with our AMSSM case series um, at the usual time on the same Zoom link. All right, take care everyone.